Good afternoon, and thank you for joining for us for today's Nevada Immunization Learning Exchange webinar. This is Brianne Van Dyne, the Program Director for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Before we officially begin, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. First, if we should become disconnected for any reason, please log in again, and we will continue where we left off. Second, please locate the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, type them there, and we will address those at the end of today's presentation. Additionally, if you are interested in claiming nursing, pharmacy, pharmacy, or CHW continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey, which will pop up on your screen when the webinar is ended, as well as in the follow-up post-webinar email that will go out tomorrow. All continuing education certificates will be emailed out within the next week. Finally, please note this webinar is being recorded. The archived presentation and slides will be available on immunizednevada.org forward slash webinars or Nile dash webinars within one week. Uh, first, we'd like to, uh, or before we officially begin, I'd like to provide a little disclaimer. Immunize Nevada's Nile webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization and infectious disease related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. I'd like to now turn it over to today's featured presenters, Alicia Stillman, founder and director of the Emily Stillman Foundation and co-founder of the Meningitis B Action Project, and Patty Wukovitz, registered nurse and founder of the Kimberly Coffee Foundation and also co-founder of the Meningitis B Action Project. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting us here today. Um, I am looking forward to a very insightful session on the current state of adolescent vaccinations in the United States. And we will be presenting strategies for hopefully improving vaccine uptake. I am Alicia Stillman, and I am the director of the Emily Stillman Foundation and the co-founder of the Meningitis B Action Project. I am joined today by my partner, Patty Wukovitz, who is a nurse and a fellow advocate who also lost her young daughter to meningococcal serogroup B, as I lost mine, um, a vaccine preventable disease. Next slide. I start out with this picture of my beautiful daughter, Emily. Emily was um, sweet, funny, caring, extremely charismatic. She was a second year student at a small liberal arts college here in Michigan. She called home one night with a headache, just a headache. I thought perhaps she was coming down with the flu. She thought maybe she was overtired because she had been up all night the previous night studying for a few tests. We decided she would take Motrin and call me the next day. She went to sleep about 10, 15. She woke up a few hours later and she said to her roommates, I think maybe I should go to the hospital. My, my head really hurts. They took her, but she walked into the hospital. She wasn't going to die. She walked in with her backpack, her computer, a textbook. She went to get her headache taken care of and, and then go home. As the late hours turned into the early morning hours the next day, her mood began to change and they began to suspect it was more than just the original migraine that had presented. It turns out Emily had bacterial meningitis, they determined, and they called me the next morning. They didn't contact me before because Emily was 19 years old. When Emily the next morning when they called and they said, I think you need to get to the hospital right away. Your daughter's very sick. She's been diagnosed with bacterial meningitis. I said, it's not possible. 
She cannot have bacterial meningitis. She was vaccinated for that disease. And they said, well, we'll discuss all that when you get here, get en route. I was you know, quite a ways away, so get en route and we'll talk about it when you get here. I remember when I was driving, I contacted her pediatrician's office and I said, I'm right, aren't I? She was, diagno she was diagnosed with bacterial meningitis. How is that even possible? Wasn't she vaccinated? They said, yep, she was vaccinated with what we have at this time. They didn't go into it either. When I got there, they were preparing Emily for a craniotomy. They said that this, the brain swelling was so severe that if she was going to survive this disease, that the brain damage would be so substantial and they wanted to lessen that. I remember thinking, well, if she makes it through surgery, she'll be okay and, and playing all these different games with myself. She made it through surgery, but she never woke up. By the next morning, I was told that everybody who loves her should be around. They determined that she was brain dead. And I said goodbye to my beautiful daughter on a very cold February morning. And I promised her I would figure out what happened and I would be her voice. So that's why I created the Emily Stillman Foundation. And then a few years later, Patty and I um, combined our foundations. We each have our separate foundation, but we created this joint initiative, the Meningitis B Action Project, which is the educational arm of meningococcal disease. I learned that my daughter had been vaccinated with what we used in the United States at that time and still do, MEN-ACWY. She had received a dose at 11 and again at 16. But in 2013, when Emily got sick, the meningitis B vaccine had not yet been licensed in the United States. And so it was not available for Emily. If it had, I believe my daughter would still be here today. We're going to tell you a lot about meningitis today and about adolescent vaccination. Right now, I'm going to turn this over to Patty and let her tell you about her daughter, and she's going to get started with our education. Good afternoon. I'm Patty Wukowitz, the executive director of the Kimberly Coffee Foundation, co-founder of the Meningitis B Action Project. I'm a registered nurse. I live in uh, New York on Long Island. And I'm going to share my daughter Kimberly's story of meningitis B with you because it's, it's so impactful when both of us share our daughter's stories because our daughters were just like anybody else's child, just like anybody else's patient. And telling their story and putting their beautiful faces to this very, very ugly disease is very impactful and very relatable. So my Kim, was this great kid growing up. She was funny. She was silly. I, I always want to say silly was her most um, out. She was outspoken. She was just an amazing person. Um, her compassion and her kindness made her an amazing human. And I was very, very proud of her. And when Kimberly was 17 years old, she was in her last week of high school on Long Island and she was looking forward to prom. She was looking forward to graduation. She was looking forward to beginning her nursing education. She was enrolled at a local college on Long Island to begin her nursing education. And her dream was to save children's lives by being a pediatric nurse. So one afternoon, Kim came home from school and she complained of body aches and a fever of 101. And I told her to take Motrin. She did. And after that, she was perfectly fine the rest of the day until we went to bed. She was perfectly fine. I did call the pediatrician and he said, it sounds like she has flu-like symptoms. Bring her in the morning if she seems to get worse. So that was the plan. We went to bed, woke up the next morning and things were so different. 
she said, mommy, everything hurts me, everything, like from my eyelashes down to my toes and just, there's something really wrong with me. I don't know what this is, mom, but this is, this is not good. And I feel like my ankles are bleeding. So I pulled back the sheets and I saw on one of her ankles, I saw a few tiny petechiae, a few little purple dots on one of her ankles, which right in front of my eyes, I saw literally start to form into larger uh, purplish lesions and this rash started to go up her body right in front of my eyes. Um, as a nurse, I knew this was very serious, no idea what it was, but I knew something was going on in her blood and I rushed her to the emergency room. Once I got her to the emergency room, they actually knew what was wrong with Kim. They um, drew blood cultures, put her in isolation right away, drew blood cultures and started IV antibiotics. They asked Kimberly and myself tons of questions. Where were you this past weekend, Kim? Who were you with? Where did you go? You know, did you share anything with anybody? All these types of questions, contact tracing. So um, she was able to answer all of these questions. However, she was in a great deal of pain at this point and they gave her some morphine. The doctor then pulled me outside of this isolation room, which had a ton of doctors in it, um, pulled me outside and said, you know, that we believe your daughter has bacterial meningitis and that the bacteria has actually infected her blood. And I just said, that can't be possible because I made sure Kim had been vaccinated with the meningitis vaccine. I know she was vaccinated. And that's when the doctor explained to me that that meningitis vaccine, the men-ACWI vaccine that Kimberly received at 11 with a booster at 16, only protects against four of the five serogroups of meningococcal disease. And that they suspect that Kimberly has serogroup B. So from, and at this point, we did not have a serogroup B meningococcal vaccine. This was in 2012. Kim was quickly admitted into the pediatric intensive care unit. She was just about six weeks shy of being 18. So she went to the PICU and she got excellent care. They, she was in multi-organ failure. She never urinated again. She was in, she was septic. She went into septic shock. They started dialysis on her about the second day and she went into cardiac arrest and they resuscitated her. And from there, she was put on a ventilator. Because Kim was septic, she wasn't receiving um, enough oxygen to her extremities. And her extremities were first bright purple and then they turned black. And they explained to me that if Kimberly survives this, she will most likely be a quadruple amputee. However, we do have hope because she does have brain activity. So we were hopeful. But then as a few more days went on, it became apparent that she was also losing blood flow to her brain and she had impending brain herniation. And it was at that point where I had to make the decision to remove Kimberly from life support. So, you know, this was a perfectly healthy 17 year old who was just sitting in her classroom the day before talking about prom and graduation and, you know, which was only in two weeks at that point. And um, unfortunately I had to remove Kim from life support and I buried her three days before her high school graduation in this beautiful prom dress that she had hanging on her closet door. And I buried her three days before her high school graduation. I know this is a lot to hear from both Alicia and I, um, the very sad stories, um, but however, they need to be told. And since this tragedy, I founded the Kimberly Coffee Foundation in honor of Kim and I speak around the country um, presenting such as this um, to healthcare providers, to parents, to adolescents, to young adults and telling them about meningococcal disease and how they can best prevent it with vaccination. So next slide, please. So I'll talk a bit about meningitis B and the MenB vaccine. Next slide. So about meningitis B. So meningococcal meningitis is the most common form of bacterial meningitis that we find in adolescents and young adults. It is mainly caused by five types of meningococcal bacteria. It's caused by Neisseria meningitidis is the name of the bacteria, but it is caused by five different serogroups, A, B, C, W, and Y. And it's a bit of an alphabet soup. It can get a bit confusing. 
Um, this bacteria can present, can um, cause two different scenarios. It can cause a bloodstream infection or meningococcemia that may lead to sepsis, which you just heard when I told Kimberly's story, or it can lead to meningitis and infection and inflammation of the membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord, which Alicia just described in her story about her beautiful daughter, Emily. Next slide, please. So about the transmission of meningitis B, uh, the symptoms and complications. So 16 to 23 year olds are at the most high risk and a lot of it is due to their behavior, their social behavior. They basically share a lot of saliva and that is how it's transmitted through respiratory secretions. So whether it's through kissing, sharing anything that comes in contact with saliva, food, a drink, um, e-cigs or vapes, something that they're passing around that has saliva on it, or being coughed or sneezed upon by someone who is actually a carrier of meningococcal bacteria, and they unknowingly are uh, passing on the disease. However, they don't become symptomatic and they don't get, get infected. It can attack without warning and symptoms, and someone can die within 24 hours from this horrific bacterial infection. The symptoms can be a high fever, a stiff neck, vomiting, a headache, exhaustion, or a purplish rash. And it can be a combination of one or all of these um, symptoms. Two, one in 10 people will die from this disease and two in 10 will face permanent complications like limb loss or brain damage. Next slide, please. So our main message through the Meningitis B Action Project is that meningococcal meningitis vaccination, it takes two vaccines. So if a person has not received both the men B and the men ACWI vaccine, they're not fully vaccinated against meningococcal meningitis. Both vaccines are recommended by the CDC and both are required by some schools. Um, more schools require the men ACWI vaccine, very few require the men B vaccine. The first dose of the men ACWI vaccine is given at 11 to 12 years old. And the second dose, a very important booster dose, is given at 16 years old. The men B vaccine, unfortunately, very few have received, but that first dose can be given at the 16 year old visit when the child is getting their booster dose of the men ACWI vaccine. And that can start their men B vaccination series. <clears throat> Depending on the brand, depends on when they get that second dose. Next slide, please. So the meningitis B vaccines, there are two that are available. One is called Trumemba. It became available in October of 2014. And the other is Bexera, which became available in January of 2015. It's very, very important to know that they are not interchangeable. So if you start with Trumemba, you must finish the series with Trumemba. If you start with Bexero, you must finish the series with Bexero. Trumemba is sometimes given as a three-dose series depending on the situation. And you know, why was there a different vaccine needed for men B? Why couldn't it have been com you know, in combination with the men ACWY vaccine? And it's because Zero group B requires um, a different vaccine because of the way it attacks the bacteria. Bacterium, it's slightly different. Both of the meningitis B vaccines are FDA approved for 10 to 25 years old, and they are both covered by insurance. And it's a really important thing to make sure that your patients know that it's, they're covered by insurance and they are both CDC recommended. I went over the, uh, the dosing on how they're administered. So currently the uptake rates for vaccination with the men B vaccines are 78.2% of 17 year olds have not received more than one dose of men B. That's not okay at all. And yet 11.1% of 17 year olds have not received greater than one dose of men ACWY. Next slide, please. So in Nevada, the men ACWI vaccine is required for all incoming freshmen, freshmen who are 23 years of age and younger. And this is required at colleges and universities. But we currently know of no colleges or universities that either recommend or require the men B vaccine in Nevada. 
And if you do know of that, we would love you to please give us that information, tell us, share that information with us. And we will add those colleges and universities to our meningitis B college tracker. tracker. And Alicia will show you a slide about the tracker in just a little bit. And now I'll turn it over to Alicia. So I'm going to talk about some of the key factors that are affecting men B vaccination rates in the United States. Next slide. First of all, ACIP guidelines um, are, are a key factor. Why does the CDC advise that 11 to 12 year olds should receive the men ACWI vaccine and 16 to 23 year olds may receive the men B vaccine? The key words there are should and may, and oh my God, they make a world of difference. There's a few reasons they have a different recommendation, um, and it's just so confusing. Uh, one is that it is a little bit of a newer vaccine. At the last time that the ACIP talked about it and reviewed it, they believed that there was not enough evidence on the duration of the protection, the effects on carriage, the effects on herd immunity, or the coverage of all the different strains within each serogroup. In addition, they kept referring to um, the low incidence of disease and the high cost of routine vaccination. That's all I can say is, as a mother who lost a daughter to this disease, where that high cost of routine vaccination would have protected her, that threw me into the public health program that I am currently in, trying to understand and make sense of that. Next slide. The problem with the recommendation is that there is inconsistent understanding of the recommendation itself among providers. The excuse me, I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, the, the key difference with those words, should and may, cause so much confusion. The, many of the providers interpret that as um, it being less important. It is referred to as being a shared clinical decision, but providers are not always talking about it. They don't understand that that is actually what the recommendation means. Nearly 50% of the providers were not even aware that this is what they're supposed to be doing. Next slide. There was a study uh, published in pediatrics back in August of 2018 and 900 doctors were surveyed. 49% of the pediatricians and 69% of family physicians do not discuss the men B vaccine during routine visits. That's a big problem because this shared clinical decision that is supposed to be made at that time, the parent or the patient or both don't know that they're supposed to make this decision. They don't know that there's a decision that to be made if the physician isn't bringing it up. Next slide, please. Also, it was felt that there was, um, it, the, the, par the parent was less apt to take the vaccine or the doctor was less apt to talk about it when a school did not require it. And many schools are not requiring it. So, they're not talking about it at that time. Next slide. We know currently of only 42 schools in the whole country that are requiring the vaccine. And you can find this list, um, this, this whole tool on the Meningitis B Action Project um, website. And it is interactive. When you click on it, you can see the cases that were there and when, um, when they started to um, require it. Care-seeking behavior barriers. We know that at the provider level, 
Um, they're not followed as closely by pediatricians. We know that these kids in this age group at 16 to 23 are transitioning between a pediatrician and a family practitioner. And because of that, they're not always transferring vaccination records. The family practitioners are not always um, even carrying the, the vaccinations. They may say, may say, you, um, you should have this vaccine. Why don't you go to CVS and get it? But really at that age, who's going searching out a uh, vaccine? And we know at the patient level, it's, they're not going as often. They're not going for yearly visits. They may be going when they don't feel well. It's inconvenient, they're afraid of needles, and there are too many shots. And there's a huge impact um, with these different barriers. There, these barriers cause a, a huge ramifications in, in so many different places. We know that 80% of, of parents still don't know about the MenB vaccine. Uh, we know that from a recent study. And we know that 70% of all meningococcal cases in the United States um, are among 16 to 23 year olds and that they are attributable to men B. We know that all 100%, 100% of college outbreaks since 2011 are caused by men B. We know that 78% of the 16 to 18 year olds have not received at least one dose of men B. And my guess is that that we haven't looked at in a little bit, especially during COVID, that that's probably um, even worse because all vaccine rates are, are down because of COVID. We also know that college students are five times more likely to contract MenB than non-college students. So we've got to do a better job protecting these kids. So let's talk about strategies to improve awareness and uptake about of the vaccinations among adolescents. So we want to turn our attention to how we can overcome some of these challenges. So, you know, it's best if we can work together with young adults to develop materials and strategies that resonate with them. Let's co-create solutions, work with them to design strategies and materials. You know, go beyond insights. It's all about integration. For example, we are currently working with peer health educators from colleges across the country to develop a meningitis B educational curriculum so that they can use that to educate students on their campuses. And then though it, this is not a new idea, what makes the difference is really integrating these kids into the process. It needs to go beyond getting their insight and then we go ahead and then put out the work. Instead, we need to work with young people collaboratively as a team from the beginning of the project to the end of the project. We all need to work together. And we have found that that seems to work best. Next slide, please. So effective messaging, empowerment versus scare tactics. So when it comes to the actual messaging for adolescents, all of us that work in public health have struggled with how to bring the best attention to that topic. So, you know, few appeals can be effective. People feel susceptible to the health problem. And they can also be confident in their ability to take action to prevent it. And this works best for a one time appeal situation. But you know, adolescents feel invincible. And as I mentioned earlier, our personal stories and concrete steps to avoid the problem can truly help. And as you can imagine, when you're dealing with adolescents that feel invincible, getting them to see an infectious disease as something that can affect them can be a challenge. We have found that um, our, although our stories are scary, again, they are relatable. But we can't just stop at the stories. We need to offer concrete solutions that will help transition them from awareness to action. 
For example, let's be very clear about where they can get a vaccine and proactive about issues that they make that, you know, they might be concerned about like cost. And as I mentioned earlier, please let people know that the meningitis B vaccines are covered by commercial insurance. Another example, we can, you know, just let, let these kids know that HPV vaccination is actual cancer prevention. I mean, that's huge. Last but not least, health messaging that puts the onus on them to take care of their health is especially effective among today's very independent, conscientious adolescents. And it's a very powerful way to overcome all of this misinformation that's out there. And I think it bears repeating again that 100% of bacterial meningitis outbreaks on our college campuses are all attributed to serogroup B or meningitis B. And that's a very, very important message that needs to be projected out. Next slide, please. Now let's switch over to the provider side and we can't forget that providers need ongoing education too. They're busy, they're overwhelmed and the reality is that they just might not have all the information that they need to have a comprehensive discussion with their patients each and every time. In our work, we frequently come across healthcare providers who confuse the MEN-ACWI vaccine with the MEN-B vaccine. We know of many kids who have asked for the MEN-B vaccine, great that they asked for it, but incorrectly, they were given another dose of the MEN-ACWI vaccine. Beyond the actual clinical education, we need to also make sure that our providers understand how to approach vaccination conversations from a psychological point of view and how, to, how this approach is used in crucial conversations. That's what can really make the difference between a patient saying yes to a vaccine or no to a vaccine. Consistency is also key consistency throughout the entire office staff, from the front desk to the medical assistant to the healthcare provider. They need to be having these conversations each and every time. Everyone has a right to know what vaccines are available to them. We know of a mom who, unfortunately, the conversation um, was not brought up with her, and her son died from meningitis B, and he was away at college. And when she Ask the doctor once all the dust settled, you know, why didn't you tell me about the meningitis B vaccine when I just had my son in for his um, college checkup, his pre-college checkup, why didn't you tell me about the MenB vaccine? And she was told that, well, we do stock it in the office. However, I only have the conversation with the patient and the parent if the parent asks me about the MenB vaccine. So we just lost a life very unnecessarily. Last but not least, make sure you talk to parent and the adolescent because both of them have skin in the game. And to bring all of this together, next slide please. To bring all of this together, if there's one thing that you remember from our presentation today, it's that all of us who are working in vaccinations have a very small window to move that patient from knowledge to action. And to do that effectively, it takes a village, it's a team sport. We need individuals to feel empowered to take control of their health and to know the importance of vaccination. We need providers to be having these critical conversations with their parents. Remember that a patient cannot know and or ask about something if they don't know that it even exists. We need schools and colleges to require vaccines when possible and we need policymakers to stand behind these strong and clear vaccination policies. All of us have a role to play in this ecosystem, and we hope that today's presentation will empower all of you who are working with adolescents to do your part to improve vaccination rates among adolescents with all of the adolescent vaccines. And now I'll turn it back over to Alicia. So the Meningitis B Action Project was created to help close the gap between um, awareness and getting the vaccinations. It became the educational arm for both Patty's foundation and my foundation um, in presenting all this educational material. So what do we do? We empower young adults with information to talk to their healthcare provider about meningitis B and the vaccines that can help prevent it. You know, this is an age where, like we talked about, they are starting to take charge of their own health and, and protecting themselves. 
We also encourage healthcare providers to discuss meningitis B and the MenB vaccinations with their patients and the parents. And we increase awareness of meningitis B on high school and college and university campuses. And we engage policymakers to facilitate broader access to the meningitis B vaccine. We do feel that um, by this we broader access, we really believe that it should be a required vaccine. Next slide. And this is not a, a mistake that you're seeing this slide again. This is the most important slide in the whole deck. Um, our key message is simple. It, it is so simple. It is, it is a very confusing message to many people because so many times I will say, um, we advocate for meningitis and they'll say, oh, well, my child has had the meningitis vaccine. And we say, no, it's meningitis B. That's a new vaccine. And they'll say, oh yeah, mm -hmm. my child had the new vaccine. They, they just went, you know, or they went in 2012, they'll say, and, and I'll know that that's not what they're talking about. It's people are confused because the second dose of MenACWI, people think that's what they're getting covered. So we tried the, the clearest message that we could with these two circles, and we have had a very good response, but this is just the most important takeaway of this whole presentation. We have, uh, next slide, we have wonderful resources. Um, the resources are available to download on our website. We also do have printed packages of them. If anybody would like us to send them, please reach out to us. We have brochures geared both to the student and to the parent. We also do have a one pager that is geared to the healthcare provider. We have tear sheets that can be used for reminders for appointments that have the two circles on. So it's a great way to explain it. We also have posters geared either to put up at a, at a health system or um, at a county office or even in a college or in a high school. We have videos that people can download and play in waiting rooms. We have magnets, one, one appropriate for a refrigerator storing vaccines and another very appropriate for dorm room refrigerators but all of this is available to download. We also speak all over the country. Um, well, we speak all over the country in non-COVID days. These days we webinar all over the country um, and I believe we'll get back to speaking um, live again, but being able to share our story around the country um, for groups of people, I think has really brought a lot of awareness to this disease. Next slide. So how we're one slide behind. These are all the resources that you're seeing now. Next slide is how can you help? Um, and so you can help um, in, in so many different ways to make sure that no other young life is unnecessarily lost. Learn about the Meningitis B Action Project. Go on our website, talk to your friends about it, talk to your community about it, talk to your patients about it, and make very clear that they understand the difference in the vaccinations, that there are two different vaccines and you need both series to be completely protected. Distribute our educational material in clinics, hospitals, offices, and colleges. Invite us to speak at local events and follow us in social media. Next slide. And now we are happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you so much to Alicia and Patty. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, we just wanted to give um, a couple of reminders. Again, should you be um, requesting continuing education credits for today's webinar, um, we ask that you complete the survey, which will pop up on your screen when the webinar is ended and also in tomorrow's uh, post uh, webinar email. Um, we uh, We'll be emailing out those uh, continuing education credits within the next week. And then in addition to completing that, um, we will 
um, also be sharing this webinar via our website within the next week at immunizednevada.org forward slash Nile dash webinars, um, both the recording and the slide set for today's presentation. Um, so first of all, Patty and Alicia, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I've heard it, I've had the privilege of hearing it several times and it never um, it ceases to just hit my and tug at all of my heartstrings. Um, the fact that you're willing to share your daughter's stories and those last moments with each of them um, repeatedly in an effort to advocate for this vaccine is nothing short of impressive. Um, and we just appreciate your advocacy and willing to willingness to share this with our group today um, as well. Um, we luckily have a lot of questions um, in the chat that have been addressed to you, um, each of you. So um, we'll go ahead and start right into those. Um, Kelly had okay. said, I want to acknowledge both your losses and say thank you for sharing your stories. Um, her question is about the provider education piece. So what um, strategy would you suggest for communicating with providers? Um, and what would we anticipate as kind of some of those most common pushbacks um, so that we can uh, address those head on? So I guess I'll start and then um, Patty just jump in and, and interrupt me. Um, you know, the I have heard everything from the provider from, um, it, you know, I don't stock vaccines because it's not cost effective and I can't put my profits into my refrigerator. Um, I mean, I really did hear that as horrifying as that sounds. I think all providers need, need should be forced to um, stock vaccines. Um, I think that it's a, a young person age 16 to 23 um, is not going in search of a vaccine. They're not calling the, um, the different pharmacies to find out who has it. it. It just doesn't happen. You got them, they're there, give the vaccine. Um, many don't know, and, and that's education. Many are confused. Um, I, at last year's AAP meeting, I, I was in an argument with a pediatrician who argued with me about the verbiage of the ACIP recommendation and he doesn't give it and he doesn't talk about it because he doesn't believe he's required to do so. And he is, it is a requirement. So it is lack of understanding. So what would I do about, I mean, if I went to a pediatrician like that, I, I first of all, I would change because I'm, I'm so pro-vaccination, um, but, I think that that's where we all have to become our own advocate and we have to know to ask for a vaccine. Right, right. And you can just to underscore that again, you can't ask for something that you just don't know about. And it's why it's so, so important that the providers have these conversations. Yeah. Patty, who just told us recently about, um, I, we, we, Patty and I have heard multiple times that, you know, a, a parent will send their child into an office and they, to get a MenB vaccine and they come out with an extra dose of the Men ACWI. But Patty, somebody told us recently, somebody came out with the Hep B, the Hep B instead of the MenB. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's why it's the, the messaging about vaccination, any vaccine, really has to start at that front desk from the person at the first point of contact. They have to all be educated about vaccination and all have the same within the practice, all have the same view and all have the same script um, because that men B vaccine turned into a hep B vaccine by the time the patient got to the back of the, you know, into the exam room. So it's, it's just so important and um, absolutely, you know, use our resources. Our resources are in thousands of provider offices across the country. We're really proud about that. Um, but we think that our two circles, again, explain it more clearly when you see that in front of you, that there's one vaccine, men ACWI, and another men B. Yeah, absolutely. I would echo the value of your resources so far as their clarity. Um, I know that we have them, um, the magnet on our refrigerator in our uh, Northern Nevada office um, as well. 
Um, and yeah, you, you're definitely um, a North Star for many organizations so far as just um, your resources and, and how clear they make that both for just the lay person and then, you know, healthcare professionals or public health uh, professionals alike. So kudos to, to the development of those resources from, from um, the, your organization. Um, the next question we have is why is men be more prevalent in adolescents and college students? And um, I know Patty, you talked about this a little bit just due to just their social behavior that this age right. dropped. Right, right. But and also that age group, the carriage rate is higher. Okay. So that also puts that risk up even higher. But it's really due, to, it's you know, mainly due to the fact of how they socialize. They share a lot of saliva. Sure. And that's how it's transmitted. That's it's what they do, you know. <laughs> so the best thing they can do is know how to be safe and know how to protect themselves with vaccination and know I mean, that they're not invincible. Yeah. And I think that it comes even so far as it, some other points that you had made as well, just that feeling impervious at that age as well. You know, you're just not as careful so far as you know, sharing water bottles even, or, you know, being in close spaces and covering your sneezes and coughs and, right, and you know. Right. And, you know, and remember that, you know, we, we know that meningitis B is five times more, um, you're at five times more risk in the college setting. Think of all the kids in that age group that are not in college. Yes. I mean, there's a ton of kids that don't go to college, a ton. Think of the kids in high school. Think of my daughter, Kim. She was a high school senior, not living in a dormitory setting. She was living at home with me. So, you know, we, you know, fa many, many parents and healthcare providers, I think, also have this false assumption that this is a college disease because we tend to hear more about it in the media when it does hit a college campus. But it Absolutely. is not just a college disease. Yes. Um. Another comment from Kathleen, I would just like to thank you for sharing your painful stories and enlighten, enlightening everyone about men beefs, just echoing the importance of that personal piece. I think as, as healthcare and public health professionals, we get very much caught up in kind of the higher level ideas of vaccination and, and you know, public health, community health, but really this comes down to you protecting people and people's daughters and sons. Um, and so again, just echoing that sentiment. Um, Rachel had a question as um, far as why are there so few universities in the country that require men be vaccine prior to entry? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think that it should be required at every university. And the interesting thing is that some colleges require some vaccines and not others. Some even require a men ACWI and don't even mention the men B. Correct. Some some require, you know, some to live in a dorm, but not to if you live off campus. Um, I do believe that anybody that lived that lives to move into a college environment should have this vaccine and it should be a mandatory vaccine. I keep thinking that maybe our, our opportunity, our foot in the door is going to be this year as so many are requiring the COVID vaccine, unless that gets challenged in some way, um, because it's going to be, you know, well, wait a minute, you're all of a sudden you're changing your mandatory vaccines to this. Let's protect them all the way now. Let's just, let's do this the right way and have a healthy college campus. Yeah, absolutely. I would say anything if the last year has taught us is the importance, uh, the important role that vaccines play in protecting um, from from these diseases. And you know, right? Why why wouldn't you just protect um, young people across the board? Across the board, right? Um, Laurel had a great question. Um, how would you approach and answer comments from parents or individuals having hesitation in vaccinating uh, their child to protect themselves from NB just due to its lower cases compared to the other serogroups? I would explain to them, you know, tell our stories again, because that, you know, without getting into the whole story, but just basically the outcome, you know, um, and what happened. And 
but also just tell them that, you know, you don't want this to be your child. It could very well be your child. Even then the numbers are low, when it's your child, that number could be one, it could be a million, it doesn't matter. And why should any child go through this horrific infection? I mean, it's bad. It's, it's awful what our girls went through. It's really awful. And if they survived, if they were lucky enough to survive, they would have had a you know, really tough life. They would have had a really tough life. So again, it's just all about prevention. That's, that's, that's really the key in all of this is just to talk about prevention. And of course, ask them what it is they're hesitant about. You know, start out the conversation that way. What, you know, what is it? And, and you know, really find out. It might just be something that you can answer very, very easily. Absolutely. Um, Jacqueline asked, do you think the MenB vaccine will be recommended for adults over the age of 25 at any point? I would say probably not because most cases are in that 10 to 25 year old age group. So most likely not. However, I will tell you that I got vaccinated. My husband got vaccinated in our fifties and our insurance covered it. So, you know, go right ahead. And I mean, for us, we're like you vaccinate us against everything, of course. So um, that's what we chose to do, but it is, it is covered under most insurance companies, preventative programs. Absolutely. I remember when the, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I remember when the vaccine was first introduced and, and Patty and I um, got it together. And I remember sending my, my mother for the vaccine. And I remember them saying to her, well, you're not between these ages. Do you really think you need it? And so she says, well, if, if the bacteria infected me and my resistance is down, could I get it or I wouldn't get it just because I'm not between those ages? And they said, well, you, you still could. It doesn't discriminate against you know, age groups. My mom says, then give me the vaccine. <laughs> I think there was a few other words in there that she sure. used that I, I... <laughs> As there should have been. Um... <laughs> We had some questions just sent privately to us in the chat too. Uh, does meningitis affect women um, and men at the same rate or is one um, over another higher at risk? No, same. There have been no studies that have shown that it prefers men to women. Okay. Um, and then, and this was a question actually I have too, um, and I probably should know this, but Melissa had asked us, is there a reason um, the sero group B couldn't be added to the men ACWY vaccine? Yeah, it's just the, that the, it's just a different way that um, the sero group attacks the bacterium. I mean, that's the best answer I can give. You know, hopefully someday we're going to have a combination vaccine. And then we could take all the guesswork out of this and get yes. kids protected against men B. I mean, that would just, to me, that would be the perfect world. In my world, that would be the perfect world. Absolutely. Um, it's yeah. kind of in line with those same hopes that we have as far as COVID vaccine being combined with flu vaccine yeah. at some point. Yeah. It's just, I, know. I think as many, yeah, as many diseases as we can protect from without you know, dealing with the issues of administration and storing and um, payment and all those pieces um, that come with stocking individual vaccines. It just mm -hmm. seems more efficient. Absolutely. So true. All right. Well, that looks to be it. Um, so far as the questions during today, today's live presentation, um, Patty and Alicia, thank you again so much for sharing your stories and methods for how um, healthcare professionals and public health professionals can um, quite literally attack men B um, and exactly what we should do um, so far as recommending um, each of the meningitis vaccines. Um, we appreciate your time and your advocacy and um, hope that everyone took uh, a little something to away uh, from today's presentation. So thank you again. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank you of so much. Of course. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.